fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Um, now joining us, we have, uh, as we said earlier, Mark Olshaker. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Wow, Mark, you're a busy guy. Um, you got the uh, second season of uh, Mindhunter coming out on Netflix on the 16th, and then you've got the right. uh, new book, um, fairly recently just came out, and it's called Across the Table with John. The, kill, the killer, the killer across the table, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Uh, by John John Douglas and myself. Uh, I think it's our eighth nonfiction book uh, together, uh, published by Day Street, part of uh, HarperCollins. Wow. Um, you guys like working together? We seem to, yeah. <laughs> Seems to work out. Seems to work out. That's okay. How did, how did you first meet? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, I, you know, I've been a writer for a long time, and I uh, um, used to pr- produce a lot of, uh, write and produce a lot of documentary films, uh, mainly for PBS. And I had done uh, a fair amount of work for NOVA, the PBS Science Series, and this goes back to the 1990s now, gentlemen. Uh, I had uh, I had written four, no, four novels myself, uh, thrillers of a sort, and I had read Silence of the Lambs, and uh, I had I called the uh, executive producer of Nova up at WGBH in Boston and said, I've read this novel, The Silence of the Lambs, and if uh, and I understand they're making a movie of it. If the movie is anywhere near as good as the book, I think it's going to be a big hit. So why don't we get ahead of the game and do a Nova program about uh, the real profilers, the real uh, people behind the uh, the Silence of the Lambs at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. So finally I convinced her that uh, this subject of kind of applied psychology was a, was a good idea. Uh, we went, and my uh, production partner Larry Klein and I went and we talked to the people at uh, at Quantico, and they agreed to do it. We so we followed this team, which was then called the Investigative Support Group, part of the Behavioral Science Unit. Uh, followed them for a while and uh, did a program called Mind of a Serial Killer, which was very successful and uh, was nominated for a National Emmy. And out of this emerged this uh, almost uh, legendary character, John Douglas, the profiling pioneer. And when he got ready to retire from the FBI after a full career, he called me and said, do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And I said, well, I certainly would be. Let's see who else is. Uh, so out of that emerged Mindhunter, which did very well. And so we just kept working together. And um, I guess we've become like uh, Holmes and Watson at this point. I'm the Watson character, by the way. <laughs> That's good. Now, Killer Across the Table, um, what, what is it that you um, are writing about here? And what is it you want people to get out of this book? Yeah, well, what we what we did was uh, this, in a way, kind of takes off on the first season of Mindhunter on Netflix, where these two FBI agents go in in the 1970s and start interviewing uh, incarcerated offenders, uh, serial killers, and the repeat violent predators. And what they're trying to do is, for the first time, correlate what was going on in the offender's mind before during and after the commission of the crime with the evidence he, and it's almost always a he, uh, leaves at the crime scene so that they can better help the police uh, narrow down suspect lists and figure out what kind of person, what kind of characteristics to be looking for, and that's really the beginning of profiling. So what we did with the killer across the table is 
while referring to some of the famous cases uh, in John's background and the FBI's background, like Charles Manson, like David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, uh, like uh, Ed Kemper, who figures so prominently in the first season of uh, Mindhunter, while we talked about those guys, what we did was we focused on four cases, four incarcerated killers that the public probably doesn't know very well, even though they're extremely dramatic, and each one tells a different story. The, the first uh, character we have in it, uh, Joseph McGowan, has only killed one person. I say only, although that has tremendous implications because he's caught. Uh, one of them, uh, Donald Harvey, has killed almost a hundred by the time he's caught. But this guy, uh, Joseph McGowan, the first case in the book, he is unlike most serial killers. He's not this marginal character on the fringes of society. He is a high school uh, science teacher in New Jersey. He's got a master's degree, and uh, he lives around the corner from uh, a seven-year-old uh, brownie named Joan D'Alessandro, who comes to his house one day, the house he shares with his mother and grandmother, to collect on uh, two dollars from two boxes of uh, Girl Scout cookies she sold. And as soon as she comes to the door, McGowan is there alone. It's after school. He looks through the screen door. He tells John Douglas, John, as soon as I saw her in the screen door, I knew I was going to kill her. Now, what what causes somebody so invested in society, so much a pillar of the community, a respected figure, if you will, to throw away everything, to kill this, to rape and murder this seven-year-old girl. That's the kind of thing we need to know about, and that's what we mean by understanding the criminal mind and understanding why people do the things they do, what they think, what the precursors are, what they think about ahead of time, how we can catch them afterwards. Um, that's the kind of thing we are uh, dealing with in The Killer Across the Table. That amount of depth that you went into on that particular case was really, yeah. really fascinating. Well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, and as, as you as you might suspect, uh, everything we do is kind of for the victims on every level. We've gotten very we, we we've gotten very friendly and uh, intimate with a lot of the families of murder victims, and including uh, Joan's mother, uh, Rosemary D'Alessandro, and. Uh, so many of them have displayed such courage. She's turned her absolute, you know, unfathomable grief into into action and proaction. Uh, uh, getting Jones Law passed in New Jersey and in other parts of the United States uh, that keep uh, these kind of offenders in prison so that they can't uh, they can't do it again. How do you prepare for something like that? Uh, you know, meeting up with people that are, are involved in these, and even the serial killers. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not the one who interviews the serial killers. John does, but you uh, you have to almost have a split personality to do that because you have to completely familiarize yourself with the case and all the facts. That's one thing, so that you know that the what what the uh, offender is telling you is true. You have to have the patience to get into the crime. Uh, on a very patient and methodical level, uh, and then you have to, no matter what you think personally, you can't show your emotion about it. You have to be very matter of fact, so that the uh, and non judgmental, so that the uh, so that the interviewee will tell you what you need to know. Uh, so it's uh, it's very difficult, and uh, it and it, it can take its toll in the same way. That dealing with the uh, victims' families, uh, as we know, can because you not only have to put yourself to do this kind of work, to do this kind of profiling, you not only have to put yourself in the mind of the killer, you have to put yourself in the mind and soul of the victim too to understand the entire dynamic of the crime. We saw John Douglas go through that specifically in your book, Mind Hunter. Do you want to you expand sure did, on that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, um, when John was doing the. Uh, uh, Green River case, Green River uh, murder case in the uh, in the 1980s he was going out to Seattle to uh to uh 
talk to and consult with the Green River Task Force, and he was dealing with so many uh, cases at that time. He had so much responsibility uh, heaped on his shoulders to try to help these uh, people take on these cases personally, and he essentially cracked when he got out there. Uh, he uh, he developed a very high fever. Uh, he was unconscious. Uh, they had to knock down his hotel. They had to break through his hotel room to get to him. Uh, he was in a coma for about a week in Swedish hospital in Seattle. He was out of work for five months, and they didn't even know if he was going to live. Uh, he ended up with uh, um, viral encephalitis as a result, and uh, all stress-induced. So um, for those of you, uh, for those of your uh, listeners who've seen the first uh, season of Mindhunter. It's not quite the same, but uh, uh, Holden Ford, our main character, um, cracks at the end, and it's all a uh, result of the stress of having to deal with this kind of thing. You know, it's not like the old J. Edgar Hoover days where it was just the facts, ma'am, where you just deal with the facts and try to find the killer and that's it. This involves so much taking on so much emotional baggage and, uh, and so much, uh, you know, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, so many of the characters that have been based on John and people like him uh, in in fiction and on television, they have the uh, they always say something like he has the rare gift, or is it a curse to think like a criminal? Well, that's not exactly right because you know if you can't think like a criminal, you probably shouldn't be a detective to begin with, as you guys know. But uh, still, taking on the emotional toll of what the uh, what the criminals do, of what these uh, serial offenders do, these predators, these people who are predators 24 hours a day, that does take its toll. And uh, and as as you said, there there are there are consequences. Now, these predators that we talk about, um, did you ever come to a resolution on whether they're born that way or whether society makes them? Well, that's that's really an excellent question, and that's probably the central question of uh, of our book, The Killer Across the Table. We deal with this theme constantly: the nature versus nurture, uh, and the answer is uh, from our experience, our study, and I think what readers will find is it's probably both. Uh, generally, these guys come from bad backgrounds of some sort or another, some kind of abuse, neglect, uh, whatever. Um, but they also probably are, are hardwired that way at birth. They probably have uh, issues with anger, with uh, aggression, with impulsivity, uh, because you, you see in, in very many cases, um, most cases actually, uh, if these guys have brothers who were raised in the same background, they don't go that same route. They don't become uh, serial predators. Hmm. But so the, the answer very clearly is it's probably, a com in most cases, it's probably a combination of both, nature and nurture. So now, do you think everybody is born with the potential to be that kind of a predator? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, what we say is that we... Um, that we are writing about the human condition, as all great literature is, but it's the human condition writ large at the extremes, uh, love, hate, jealousy, revenge, all those kind of things. And I think we all have those emotions, no question about it, but I think most of us um, are able to mediate them uh, with, I guess, what Freud called the superego. Most mm -hmm. of us can control our impulses, can uh, can conform our behavior to society, do know and understand and appreciate the difference between right and wrong. But you have this small cohort, but a cohort nonetheless, that uh, really has no empathy, probably born without it, uh, just wants to do whatever they want to do. And Everybody else is an object, and what's important to them, and if it happens to be uh, sexual murder, that's more important than anything else. It's what they think about all the time. They're on the hunt nightly for victims, and when they can't be on the hunt, they're thinking about it. And the other person's, well, let's put it very plainly, the other person's right to live is not important to them. It's not as important as fulfilling their own desires or their own satisfaction. 
So these are all scary characters that you're writing you about. You bet they are. You bet is they there, are. Is there one in particular that stands out to you? Well, they're all scary in different ways. Um, let's take two, for instance, that are in the book. Um, Donald Harvey is scary because he's a very mild-mannered guy, uh, very friendly, and if you met him, you'd probably either pay no, you'd either like him or you'd pay no attention to him. Uh, and over a period of years, he killed close to a hundred people, and nobody ever thought anything about it. Why? Because he was working as a hospital orderly and nurse's aide, and the people he was killing were presumed to be dying of natural causes. So he was he was invisible. The people people were looking right through him, and yet he could kill at will through all manner of means because he understood the he understood the environment he was in, the medical healthcare environment, and people looked right through him. It didn't occur to him to people that he was actually killing people, enhancing death rather than preventing it. Uh, that's on one end. He's very scary because, as I say, we're looking right through him. On the other side, we have somebody like Joseph Condro, a very marginal guy who's also in the book, and his thing is raping and murdering young girls, teenage girls, and yet, while this is not unusual among serial killers, this guy thought, rather than find strangers, he would attack and target the daughters of friends of his, because they would go with him willingly, they would trust him. Uh, nobody would suspect him. It was easy. He would then join in the uh, in the search to look for them after they had disappeared, and nobody suspected him for quite a while. So I find that kind of betrayal of trust just as scary as, as probably any other kind of, uh, of killer, to think that somebody who you consider your friend could brutally attack your daughter uh, and kill her and uh, get rid of the body and then, and this is part of the true story and then go home that same night, change clothes and go with your ex go with his ex-wife to a parent-teacher meeting at school mm, yeah uh, so what's your thought? is this, is this would it be just like an addiction that uh, a serial killer is facing? I wouldn't call it an addiction I call it a compulsion. Maybe uh, it's something. It's you know, for most of us, loving our family, providing for them, providing for their health, uh, pursuing our careers, doing good work is the most important things in our lives. For these guys, it's their crimes that that satisfaction that they get. These nobodies, these nothing people, these losers, if you will, for this one moment. When they're in control, uh, this is they are they are controlling life and death and everything in their lives. They are they are the directors of the movie uh, in their mind, and, and yet it's coming true in real life. And so that's the most important thing in their lives, and that's very difficult for ordinary people like us to understand. And that's probably why they're so scary. But that's why it's important to understand this part of let's call it aberrational psychology. I, I would imagine the uh, rise in social media and access to everyone um, really helps them now. Well, I think in some ways it does. I think uh, John always believes that the public can be used to help find people if we can describe what we expect from them post-offense, uh, that, that they can be identified. And uh, one thing, we guys, that we try never to do is we don't glorify these people. There are no, notwithstanding what I said about Silence of the Lambs before, there are no Hannibal Lecters in real life. There are no criminal mastermind geniuses. These are marginal people in one way or another, and um, and many of them are cowards. They're all sadists in their way. They're all narcissists. And so um, one thing we never do is glorify them. This is all about it. the only people we glorify are the victims and the survivors because they are the real heroes of this story. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, with the media there's certainly no end of fascination, which I certainly understand and which I guess we're taking advantage of in trying to make people understand what's out there but uh, yeah I, I I agree with you about the uh, the media yeah 
I wonder now, the, um, when you talked about uh, marginal people and all that, mm-hmm. um, but yet you had that science teacher, the person that was part of, you know, successful. Yeah, Joseph McGowan. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. now, so Joseph McGowan, is that a very common that you come across that? It's not common, which is one of the reasons we wanted to write about him. But uh, there are people like that, and uh, there are people who are mar- marginally like that. Say, um, why why did uh, why did the Catholic Church and so many other institutions uh, allow all of this, um, you know, sexual predation and and child abuse for all these years? Um, but they did. Uh, so no, McGowan is not usual, but I think we have to understand that there are people like him out there. And um, one of the big issues in this, uh, in in the story we wrote about him in the book, is whether a guy like this, who's killed once so brutally, um, should he be uh, paroled out of prison for a while? And after John, this, I, think, I don't want to give it too much away, yeah. but mm-hmm. after John talks to him for hours and hours in prison uh, at the behest of the New Jersey State uh, Board of Pardons and Paroles, uh, he says, no, this guy is not reformed. We should not let him out. If he gets into a similar situation, he could do the same thing again. And uh, and why did he do it? Well, it took a long time to try to uncover that, but the answer is there. It's in the book, and it's it's in the interview. Do you think that the justice system is adequately equipped to handle people like this? Well, this, that's a very difficult question. Um, you know, I, I th- and, and it, it is probably the central question. I think it's like uh, m- medicine or terrorism or war or anything else. We do the best we can. It's a continual fight. We keep trying to get ahead of the enemy. But uh, just as we will make great improvements in medicine and the fight against disease, we will never uh, we will never cure it. There will never you know be no death, if you will, no disease. Just like there will always be crime. But uh, we do the best we can to try to understand the criminals better, so that we can catch them quicker, so that we can use more science like DNA. We can use more soft science like psychology to uh, help bring them down, and um, we can make the public understand more of what goes into these people so that they can recognize them more easily and and understand. Have you noticed an evolution of a sort um, with serial killers over the years, the the way they behave? Well, that's an interesting question, too. Uh, We used to say that uh, serial killers were almost exclusively from the uh, white race. Now we're seeing some from minorities and uh, other uh, foreigners as well. Um, So I think as people become more, uh, if you will, uh, assimilated into society, they are more likely uh, to become. I think we have a big gun culture in this country, so but that's not what we're talking about. These are the the people we deal with, these predatory types. uh, They're not the mass killers that's a completely separate category although just as uh, just as upsetting and dangerous so i think we have seen some evolution but by the same token i think probably a lot of it is just more our understanding for example we all think of uh, jack the ripper as in 1888 london as being you know maybe the first serial killer of you know sexually oriented serial killer um as we talked about in a previous book of ours the cases that haunt us but when we look back through history probably a lot of the things that were either chalked up to supernatural causes like witches or werewolves and things like that were probably serial killers from an earlier age so uh probably it's been around for quite some time and we just didn't uh, we just didn't recognize it so there's been some evolution but uh, the basic motivation of uh, wanting to be in control of this manipulation domination and control of another human being i think that part is is pretty static as is the basic psyche of the uh, repeat predator which is this and this is true in almost all cases that i can think of uh, this constant warring within them of this feeling of uh, entitlement and grandiosity and 
they are better than everybody else and the rules don't apply to them. And combined with this is this deep-seated, very basic feeling of inadequacy. And those two uh, impulses are constantly warring with each other. And that's the part that I think remains constant. So that's a very good question. Oh, there, I got one. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've gotten more than one. You guys are, you guys are asking all the right things. I, you know, I was going to say, when you said about mass shootings, uh, because there are so many, I, I, sure. I, there, there's a big difference between mass shooters and a serial killer. But yet, Absolutely. But yet, I, I, why I bring it up is because I see a lot of comments on our website about, oh, it's the same thing. People just kind of assume. No, it's not. And it's not. It's a totally yep. different character. It's a, it's a totally different character. Let's, let's, let's start with one basic premise. The, uh, the serial killer the repeat killer uh, is doing it for his own um, repeat purposes, obviously, his own wish fulfillment, and he expects to get away with it. The mass killer, by and large, does not expect to. He expects either to die by his own hand, uh, or what we call a suicide by cop. Uh, he doesn't expect to get away with it. This is his one moment of glory, so they are completely different. He is certainly a predator in one sense, but his crimes generally are completely impersonal. Even this horror we just saw in El Paso, uh, yes, the killer was uh, most likely a white nationalist, and he was targeting... Uh, Mexican immigrants or what he perceived to be Mexican immigrants but it was still completely uh, depersonalized I mean he didn't know any of these people he didn't want to know any of these people he had no personal relationship with them the serial killer on the other hand is predatory he is looking for a particular person even if he never meets them like uh, uh, David Berkowitz the son of Sam who would walk up to uh, uh, men and women sitting in cars and you know secluded lovers lanes in New York and shoot them both still that was a much more personal relationship he was essentially saying I'm gonna take away from you what I don't have myself so yeah I agree with you completely this is uh, the the mass murderer and uh, the serial killer by both certainly sick by our terms though by no means uh, insane uh, it's a completely different phenomenon when, when you talk about the son of Sam, um, yeah. we had Carl De Niro on, and he's one of the survivors, right, of being shot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He's, he's um, totally convinced that a woman shot him and that that, that was all part of a cult. Um, you know, that the whole thing. The son of Sam? Yeah. It, That's it, interesting. Yeah, he has a, a website now, and uh, his, his idea was that uh, it's a cult. That did the killing, and not, and it wasn't even Berkowitz. Well, I would first of all, Berkowitz has admitted it, but uh, yeah. not, that notwithstanding, um, I would have to see more evidence. But uh, I, I, I don't, I don't see that. Um, everything we know about Berkowitz's personality, everything we know about his methods, everything we know about his background, uh, it all all fits in. Um, you know, it's very, conspiracy theories of all kinds are rampant in our business uh, from, you know, the, the Kennedy assassination on up. Um, and really, you know, we've obviously made a study of this, and anything, the for the conspiracy theorist, anything that is not impossible becomes possible and therefore becomes plausible and therefore becomes likely. So, uh, you know, I would have to see the evidence, but uh, I... Let's say I'm skeptical. Yeah, no. you you folks went in depth into that in the uh, the cases that haunt us, and specifically. Yeah, we we tried to sure. Yeah, Jean Benet Ramsey was yeah. uh, one of the most compelling ones there for me. Yeah, well, thank thank you, and uh, you know that's a perfect example of uh, of what we call confirmation bias. Uh, you go in with a certain attitude to the case, and it's also a perfect example of what I call better than the truth. Uh, it applies to the John Benet Ramsey case. It applies to the Amanda Knox case and the West Memphis Three case that we wrote about in our last book, uh, Law and Disorder, which is. If the story that's put out, whether it's put out by the police or the prosecutors or the media or whoever, if that story is better than the, what the evidence shows, what re, in other words, what really happened, 
the truth and the evidence uh, don't have much of a chance. And uh, as you guys know from your own work, um, it's it's very easy to uh, to condemn somebody based on what you think or what sounds like a good story rather than what the evidence shows. Yeah, it's pretty constant. Uh, <laughs> we hear it all. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, we hear it all. I tell you. Um, now, with serial killers, do you ever think there's a, a, a place for them in society? You mean, can they be rehabilitated? Yeah. Can, or are we able um, to fix them? Probably not. I mean, um, the, the forensic psychologist Stanton Samenow, who we quote a lot, has uh, posited that how are you going to rehabilitate somebody who's never been habilitated in the first place? Uh, some people who you get young, some, you know, one, there's n numerous typologies of rapists. So there's one type of rapist you can probably uh, rehabilitate if you get him early enough. But uh, anybody who has repeatedly killed in a predatory, sadistic nature, um, I don't think that we have any real evidence that they can be uh, rehabilitated. And even if you put them on ice in prison, uh, they still relive these crimes over and over again in, in their minds. And, you know, the way I put it is, if you take somebody who's killed repeatedly, particularly children or teen, you know, teens or whatever, if you take a hundred of these people and you think maybe they're rehabilitated and you, you parole them, what's your acceptable failure rate? What percentage? I mean, uh, you willing for four percent to reoffend, two percent, five percent? When you put it in those terms, it's uh, it's it's pretty stark. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's not a. No. So you know, so it, I, I I know what your next question is going to be, and yeah, I do. I certainly believe that there's a lot of people in prison who don't need to be, you know, nonviolent offenders, uh, particularly of drug crimes. Yeah, we've got way too many of those in prison who don't need to be. But the people, the violent offenders. I mean, the one thing we know for sure is past behavior predicts future behavior. Past violence predicts future violence. So those are the people I'm really leery about letting out. Yeah. Uh, why do they get out in probation then, or parole? Well, sometimes the prisons are uh, overcrowded. Sometimes they convince um, they convince prison personnel or psychiatrists that uh, that they're okay. Remember, uh, if you go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist on your own, uh, you want to feel better. You probably have a vested interest in telling that uh, person the truth. Um, when you're in prison and all you want to do is get out. You have a vested interest in lying if that's what's necessary to get out. Um, so uh, sometimes it's you know mandatory um, maximum sentences, but uh, anybody who's committed repeated violent acts like that um, of a predatory nature, um, I would be very skeptical. And you know, you you I'm sure you've heard about this case uh, of this. I, th I think as a guy in his seventies who they uh, who who had been a repeated. Uh, killer who they let out of prison and because they figured he'd, a he'd aged out and he killed somebody else within weeks of being let out so you know um, yeah uh, well what i was going to say what should be done then with serial killers well um you know we can get into a discussion of the death penalty which uh i am against in many ways, but for these kind of people, uh, I think it's it's appropriate, and I have no problem with it. It's not uh, in the case of uh, repeated predatory criminals. It's generally race uh, or minorities are not an issue. Uh, whether they did it or not is not an issue. The proof is overwhelming. Whether they'll do it again is not an issue, and the viciousness and sadism of their crimes is not an issue. So, I for these kind of people, I have no problem with the death penalty. But otherwise, I I want to I want them warehoused. I I don't want them out in society. That's uh, I think they've they've given up that right. Uh, and then there's other people, you know, this, each of these things you're talking about gets into such interesting discussions. Um, you know, if you ask me of the remaining Manson family members, do I think any of them are dangerous anymore? Absolutely not. I really don't. Should they be let out of prison? 
I don't think so. I've seen the uh, I've seen the crime scene photos from 1969. I've seen what they looked like. I've seen what they did to Sharon Tate and Lino uh, LaBianca La and all of the other people. And you know, there's certain things that are just so vicious they can't be forgiven. I mean, you have to. I mean, the punishment for its own sake is is important for society, I think. So, you know, you're asking very difficult but, but very important questions, very relevant questions. Yeah, there's that one that keeps getting parole that the governor keeps yeah. turning her down, right? Exactly, but, yeah. yeah. Les, Leslie, Leslie, Leslie Van Houten, Houten. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. And I agree with you. I feel the same way. You know, um, there's just something about what they did that I just can't let go of. Yeah, and you know, if they've if they've seen the light and uh, they're uh, rehabilitated, I feel good for them. Fine, um, but you know, it's it's not up to me to forgive them. Uh, yeah. It's the peop- the only people who can forgive them has to be in the next world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually fifty years ago today that uh, is it today? Wow, I re- I remember when it happened, uh, which shows how old I am, I guess. But uh, wow, is it fifty years ago today? That's yes, yeah. I was three wow. three days old. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not going to tell you how old yeah, I was. No, so. I, <laughs> I was only seven, so I didn't. You know, I was Again, I'm not going to tell you how yeah. old. I was. <laughs> we're not we're not going there. Come on, tell the truth. Uh, I'll tell you. Oh, you know, and one one last question before we go. Um, sure. Now I got this that uh, fact that 67 percent of known serial killers are in the United States. Now, if if it's true or not. Um, is there a reason that the, such a high percentage in America? Yeah. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, there could be several reasons for that. We have a very open society, for one thing. We have a very heterogeneous society, for another. Uh, and uh, and and we have very good um, media, so uh, a lot more is reported. So. I would suspect there's a lot going on in other countries that we don't know about, um, but uh, a lot of countries also have very draconian laws, and if somebody uh, commits any crime, uh, they're likely to be taken off the street and maybe taken out of the world um, before they would have a chance to become uh, repeat offenders. So, you know, it's just speculation, but uh, I would suspect the, the figure is... It's, it's at least questionable. Yeah, I I think so too. I think perhaps it's because the U.S. has become so adept at catching them, and maybe some of these. Well, I think things. that's a very good point. I I, yeah. I I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Well, it's on another book that I'm listening to now, and I won't mention it, but we'll be interviewing them, so <laughs> we'll we'll see where the numbers come from. But I sort of have that view too. There's a lot of countries. How do they report? Them? Is that is are, are you talking about the book about uh, Israel Keys? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, what's what's interesting, and I don't know if this is uh, this is a dubious distinction, but uh, I understand from uh, reading about him that Mindhunter was one of his favorite true crime books, one of his two favorite true crime books. Well, there you go. So you did it. <laughs> <laughs> so where? Wow. <laughs> now, okay. So, uh, do you have a website that you want listeners to go to? Yeah, people. Uh, if, they can go to our website and find out about our books. It's um, mindhuntersinc.com. That's M-I-N-D-H-U-N-T-E-R-S-I-N-C.com. I think they can also go to mindhunters.net. Uh, uh, it'll take you to the same place. And the new book uh, is The Killer Across the Table, published by Day Street from John Douglas and myself, available on, here's my commercial, I guess, <laughs> available on Amazon and your uh, local favorite bookstore. Right. And I know in Seattle, you've got some great bookstores. There's a few. Um, actually, yeah. and what I'm going to do is I'll, uh, we'll have your book um, on the website as well, so people listening can just do one click and pick it up. Uh, That's great. It totally, and uh, we look forward to uh, Mine Hunters season two starting on the sixteenth. That looks really exciting, and um, we're glad you took the time to talk about uh, your book, um, Mark. Well, well, th- thank you, Al. You're you've always been a good friend, and Mike. It's great to talk to you both, and uh, and I appreciate your having me. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Okay. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. 
To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.